Hey guys, Montel here. Welcome to this very special edition of Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Why is it a special edition? Because today is Veterans Day. Yay! Come on now. With your bad self. And what does Veterans Day have to do with Let's Be Blunt? We're going to get to that in a minute. You'll see the connection as soon as I introduce my guest. But before we do so, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what Veterans Day is really all about. Veterans Day is a U.S. legal holiday dedicated to American veterans of all wars. And Veterans Day 2023 will occur on Saturday, November 11th. In 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, an armistice or temporary cessation of hostilities was declared between Allied nations and Germany in World War I, then known as the Great War. Commemorated in many countries as Armistice Day, that following year, December 11th, became a federal holiday in the United States in 1938. In the aftermath of World War II and the Korean War, Armistice Day became known as Veterans Day. That's how we even got a Veterans Day, folks. And it's so great that we're celebrating that day today. And, you know, and just if you want a little bit of history about it, you know, the Treaty of Versailles was signed on June 28, 1919, making the official end of World War I that day. Nevertheless, the Armistice Day of November 11th, 1918, remained uh, the public, uh, it remained the date that the public actually recognized the conflict as ending, but it truly ended on the June 28th. Now, one year later, November 1919, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed November 11th as the first commemoration of Armistice Day. The day's observation included parades, public gatherings, as well as a brief pause in business and school activities at 11 a.m. On November 11th, 1921, an unidentified American soldier killed in the war was buried at Arlington National Cemetery near Washington, D.C. And on that same day, the previous year, unidentified soldiers were laid to rest at Westminster Abbey in London and at the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. In 1926, on June 4th, Congress passed a resolution that the recurring anniversary of November 11, 1918 should be commemorated with thanksgiving and prayer, an exercise designed to perpetuate peace through goodwill and mutual understanding between nations, and that the president should issue an annual proclamation calling for observance of Armistice Day. But again, that was turned into Veterans Day post World War II and the Korean War. And so, again, why am I talking about let's be blunt on a day like this? Well, let me tell you why. My guest today earned his bachelor's degree from Purdue University and three master's degrees from the University of West Florida, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He served in the United States Navy for over 20 years as a naval aviator and a commanding officer. During his military career, he accumulated over 3,500 flight hours. And folks, that's a lot of dang on flight hours, let me tell you. <laughs> in multiple rotary and fixed wing aircraft, uh, supporting numerous campaigns worldwide before retiring. His professional experiences span global development, aviation, organizational, developmental, innovation, macroeconomics, security cooperation, defense financial management, and acquisitions. He now serves as the executive director of the Veterans Cannabis Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving U.S. military veterans' quality of life through the opportunity of cannabis. Stephen Jones, thanks you so much for being a part of Let's Be Blunt with Montel today, sir. No, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. I don't know whether to call you Montel, Mr. Williams, or sir. Oh, but come I on, thank, man. Come I on. want to thank you for your service. Captain, and, come uh, on. I, 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 I feel like I should call you Captain, but let's just let's just stick right, right, here. Right, right, right. No, it's truly my honor uh, to be able to get the message and talk about veterans and, 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 and my proud service and your proud service is something that I'd love to talk about. Absolutely. So let's let's get let's jump right on in with two feet. Where did you grow yeah. up? Where were you from? Uh, I grew up, I'm from Texas. I'm a Texan by birth, but I grew up primarily in Midland, Michigan. Uh, both my parents were chemists. Uh, they transferred up to Midland when I was a kid. So I went all through my formative years in a small town called Midland, about three hours north of Detroit. Gotcha. Now, did you have an experience with cannabis before you entered the military or no? You know, you know, is is one of those things, you know, it was spring break. My senior year in high school was my first time. Uh, you know, had an older friend, but that was my first time with cannabis. Uh, 
uh, I was a recreational user probably through my, you know, years of high school and into college. But there becomes a time where you have too much to lose and so much to gain, and Absolutely. never look back from that. And never look back from that point. Um, but that was my time early on, and then post retirement, um, again uh, got back into the cannabis. Uh, but from there, now I'm in a profession where I cannot do it. I'm currently a first officer for an airline. I actually work for Atlas Air, fly uh, Amazon Prime packages on my off time uh, just because I wanted to get back to flying again. But that's something that we can talk about. But sure, yes. it was on, off, on, now off. Well, you know, I mean, we have similar careers. So it's similar the same way because I, I literally dabbled in high school. Of course, I went to Marine Corps and then went to the Navy. And as I got in the Navy, well, I went to the Naval Academy, graduated, got my commission as a Naval officer. And I was a specialty intelligence officer. I was a direct support cryptologist. So we were getting tested like almost every three to four every months. Day. Yeah. 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 Security agency. So, you know, there was no, you just said it. When, when your career is, you know, on the line, you got to, you know, stay away. And so I tried my best to stay away and um, did so until I got out of the service. But very, very interesting and strange because while in the service, I, I got to tell you, I was part of the submarine force for a while. And anybody who knows the submarine force back in that day, you know, we always pulled into Holy Lock, Scotland. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I look back at it now and, and wonder how the Navy let us be as drunk, as drunk asses as we are. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, you pull into Holy Lock, Scotland, everybody would get off after a three month sub trip. You know, you go buy yourself a, a fifth of Glen Fettick or Glen Lemon and sit around until you, you know, reach the bottom of the bottle, which is really yeah. stupid. Nobody cared about that. But everybody nah. had to take a hard on about, you know, hard on about cannabis. So um, after getting out, you know, I, I ran, I, I really kind of didn't have a problem with alcohol, but it wasn't necessarily my friend. Um, you know, I, yeah. I literally, you know, probably overindulged too many times to the point that I remember there was a moment in my life where I just really literally transitioned back to cannabis. And as I look back on it, and this is what I say to a lot of people right now, is that almost everybody who literally picks, I think, cannabis over alcohol is doing so for a medical reason. Whether or not you think it's recreational or not, I really truly believe that inside it is a medical reason whether you do it because like, you want to sleep better whether you do it because you want to relax at the end of the day to relieve anxiety all those things are medical reasons to me so i kind of gravitated back towards cannabis even before i was diagnosed with ms but when i got my diagnosis with ms that's what really set me on the path of cannabis exclusively i quit drinking back uh Honestly, I think 99, 2000, and I haven't gone back. I mean, I probably have a sip of champagne once on New Year's Eve every year, and that's it, just to toast New Year's Eve. But I am exclusively a cannabis user. Now, did you always want to be an aviator when you were growing up? Yeah, well, yes, I did. Um, my father was, uh, he, it, you know, he is a Marine Corps veteran, uh, went to Vietnam, uh, grew up in East Texas. Uh, saw the Marine Corps and the GI Bill as a as a as an opportunity to change his life, and mm -hmm. so that's what he did. But during that time, sixty two to sixty five, he was in Vietnam, stationed in Japan. But he was a mechanic. He was a Marine Corps mechanic. He worked on F four Phantoms, uh, F eight Crusaders, and A four Skyhawks. And I remember those, you know, those Kodak reel to reels. Well, he right. turned all those pictures uh, into slides, and he would look at those slides um, when I was a kid. That turned in my love for third generation fighter airplanes, and that's what I wanted to do. My parents, you know, I was lucky to have both parents. They cultivated my interest um, in aviation and flying, took me to Davis Monthan Air Force Base, the Boneyard, took me to the Smithsonian uh, uh, Aviation Museum, and I was that kid. I built models, was flying at 15 years old at my local airport. Um, try to turn it into an appointment, not at the Naval Academy, but into the Air Force Academy, much like yourself, mm -hmm. uh, did not get in uh, into that into that situation. And, and uh, I thought the dream was over, right? Majored in business at Purdue University, did my internships at GE, General Electric on the East Coast in Connecticut. But it was a, by sure chance, uh, I think it was like back in 1996 or 1997, where I met a recruiter. And at the time, the Navy had cut too many pilots from the uh, first Gulf War. 
uh, it was a great rift. And so there was a big recruitment for folks to come off the street, you know, much like Richard Gear, an officer and a gentleman. And right. so that's what I did. I went to OCS, but I was lucky enough to have a mentor, for, uh, retired Marine Corps aviator, now a CEO of a GE business. You know, obviously this person could do no wrong. And he put his hands on my shoulder and he just looked at me kind of, kind of, uh, no pun intended, but bluntly, and was like, son, there's only certain things you can do when you're young and GE will always be here. And I never looked back, joined the Navy about two weeks later. And so that's how I, you know, it was a dream deferred, but it was a, it was a, it was a dream that I was able to attain. You know, it's very crazy now. I literally grew up the same way, wanting to be a pilot. And I, by the time I, I went to Marine Corps enlisted because my parents had kind of run out of money for college. So I went to Marine Corps enlisted, same thought process as your father. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I came in in, in 73. So I just barely came in right under the wire for, um, you know, the national defense. And I went to the academy, but unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to the Navy, unbeknownst to the Marine Corps, I probably had my first episode of MS right before graduation from the academy. Um, if you looked at my Naval Academy ring on the inside of it says Marine Corps Air. I even entered the, the Naval Academy VTNA program. I got like 37 hours of flight time at the Naval Academy, almost got close to getting my private pilot's license. Um, but then right before I graduated, um, commensurate with our pre-commissioning pre immunizations, I um, had a severe reaction to one of the immunizations that literally put me in the hospital um, right before graduation. I almost didn't even graduate from the Naval Academy. I was, I was put on medical hold. I went blind in my left eye. Um, I had all these neurological issues. And back then, they didn't think that it was possible for black people to get MS. So I was misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed. Finally, my vision did come back. So I was able to be commissioned, but I was only able to be commissioned. I, the Marine Corps wouldn't take me back because my vision was uncorrectable to 2020. So uh, I had to go in the Navy and I was given two choices, Supply Corps or Crippy. And because I, I had been a Chinese, I had studied Chinese at the Naval Academy, they went, well, you're in the languages, so we'll send you off to the Defense Language Institute. So I became a Crippy and got commissioned and ended up spending more time at sea than any of my contemporaries. <laughs> I, I, I'm a Crippy doing direct support. So I, I sailed on every platform we have from aircraft carriers to guided missile cruise, cruises to destroyers to you name it, even did submarines for quite a while. So that was kind of crazy. Um, yeah, uh, crypto techs have very interesting careers. I mean, they're a little bit everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I even landed yeah. on Grenada, which was really kind of crazy. Right, right. You know? I was a yeah. part of the invasion force back there. So tell me a little bit about your military career. Where did you serve? So, yeah, so I um, served in two communities. So when I graduated flight school, I got my wings of gold in 2000. My first selections, I flew MH-53 Echo Sea Dragons out of Corpus Christi, Texas. For those who don't know, we were minesweeping helicopters. And, uh, and it's kind of, you know, when you're going through selection, there's a lot of reasons on why you do it. Um, but I just wanted to fly the biggest, ugliest helicopter I'd find. The instructors that I flew with, it seemed like a good personality fit for me. And I thought I could be able to excel in that particular community. Um, cause the Navy is like, you know, is you have your big tent Navy and then every part of it, it's about community and where you can fit in. I really paid attention to that. Had a fantastic tour. And this is before nine 11. I remember showing up, uh, uh, finally in Corpus, I think August of 2001, newly married, uh, newlywed. We had just moved down to Corpus Christi, Texas. My wife and I were staying in like an extended stay hotel. We we're closing on our first house. And we watched 9-11 happen um, oh. on TV. Um, and I was like, wow, OK, OK. And, and for some reason, I always kind of thought I remember watching the first Gulf War. You know, I think I was in junior high at the time. And I remember we were playing basketball and they paused the game. And I remember thinking that I just like this was going to be I was going to be involved in this. You know, I'm not superstitious at all, but I just had a feeling that this particular region was going to be the region that I was going to be involved in. Uh, and it was, uh, came into work, not sure it was going to be, but I know from that point that South Texas flying club that I thought I was joining because it wasn't a very much deployed asset turned into, we were gone, split the squadron in half, 
uh, in about in February of '02, and so we were there for the buildup. Um, did my three years? I think I did three tours during that time, all within Iraq. Came back to my sea shore tour. Flying the same flying the flying same platform. Yeah, flying the same platform. But then I switched. I uh, was a flight instructor uh, in Pensacola, Florida. I was a VT six shooter. Uh, great tour, but from that time I switched to fixed wing and I started flying C one thirties out of New Orleans. That really and then uh, that became about the travel and destination. Helicopters are fun, but planes are more practical, right? And I got to go to a lot of places, see a lot of things, and understanding history. One of the things I used to do is kind of fly with an atlas, so I could be able to learn about the countries I was flying on, whatever is the Sinai Peninsula. Niger, Malawi, there's a history there. And seeing the development and how the U.S. foreign policy can affect uh, how nations behave, how their industrial base grows, really kind of got my economic development uh, into play during that time. And it was because of travel, flying big airplanes, long distances. And so my flying career ended uh, in the Navy in 2010. But what started from that was an acquisitions and contracting uh, development, um, supporting the State Department, the embassy teams through their development through security cooperation, which kind of developed that, uh, you know, that more so that tactical field, more of that strategic and operational field for things. And I really enjoy that. And that's why I tried to cultivate through the rest of my education. Cool. And so when you retired and got out, what did you transition to as your first career? Yeah, so retirement was was great. I was a commanding officer of a reserve center in Charleston, South Carolina. And one of the things that I did is I spent about probably about 18 months thinking about transition. You know, when you're transitioning out of the military or a career switch at 40, 42 years old, I have now spent almost 21 years in an organization thinking about one thing, one thing only, you know, readiness, my deployability and taking care of my family. Right. And so I had, you know, lost touch from that time on what other people did for money. Um, was fortunate enough to be pretty decent at school, decent test taker. And so part of that transition plan, I wanted to have a place where I could say it was a good place to be from. And that was Harvard University. And that was the Kennedy School. So, you know, went back in the books, got a tutor study for the GRE and went to Harvard. And part of that was one, twofold. It was one to have my family just kind of escape. We we're going to move up to Boston, the Cambridge area, be together. The program is very family inclusive. So I got to take classes with my wife. I could take classes at MIT, Tufts or Harvard or any school at Harvard. And so it just seemed like a great place to be to kind of recage my life, uh, develop my network. And that's exactly what I did. And uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, that's great. No, keep going. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I spent a lot of time. We'll talk about this later. I spent a lot of time in, in the Boston Mass area. As a matter of fact, uh, I funded some research at Harvard years back uh, around MS and, um, you know, got to know a lot of people up there. I, I'm now still part of, uh, I'm on the board of Ann Romney's uh, uh, neuroscience clinic at the um, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and, um, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm working on a project. I'm working with those who are working on a project right now at MIT um, because I've been working on, a, on something we can talk about a little bit uh, during this conversation, something called RTM, which is called Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories, which is the only really known cure for PTSD in the world. I've been working on that a bit, so I spend a lot of time there. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm working, I'll tell you a very funny one, I, I'm working directly with Secretary Del Toro right now uh, on this initiative, and I just got a great invitation from his office to join him for the Army-Navy football game up in Mass. Uh, nice. this year, and I'm going to take him up on it, so. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Now, that's great. And, and, and so when you meet different folks and different things and transitioning there, um, I worked for a fantastic nonprofit organization called the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. And in that, and in that, and this is where it kind of blends to uh, progressive therapeutics. And in that work, you get introduced to a lot of different technologies. One of them was artificial intelligence. 
Right. And the particular artificial intelligence was developed at a Louisiana State University uh, for a drug discovery called Deep Drug. Learning about that and being in biotech is something that I really wanted to be in. And I was with this fantastic group at the University of Saskatchewan in Vancouver, where they looked at neglected or, uh, you know, neglected or rare diseases, or I like to call non-profit or non-profitable diseases, right? And in looking to find cures or progressive treatments for that. You know, the artificial intelligence, what I witnessed and saw were them to be able to do drug combinations, repurpose drugs and develop new molecules, both small and large. And because of that, I got into this realm of progressive therapeutics and cannabinoids. And I saw an excellent opportunity, one, to get, you know, you know, recommendations and everything out of the chat room, but in actual clinical research. That brought me back here to Washington, D.C., where I met the founder, Nick Etten and Doug Destasso of the Veterans Cannabis Project, and they're talking about the work that they're doing. Um, and I was like, you know what? Speaking with veterans, and, and even while I was in a commanding officer, I supported greatly the Returning Warrior Foundation, where folks were coming back from conflict, talk about their issues. And there's two things I would think that is desperately needed. One is, 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 is counseling and to be able to talk peer-to-peer uh, connection of groups, but also progressive therapeutics and allowing the doctors to be able to talk that way. I think that is where your cure or your ability to manage PSD, PTSD, or traumatic brain injury when it comes to self, but also with their families. Absolutely. Well, you know, that brings us to the conversation why I started this. And I said, how does Veterans Day and, you know, let's be blunt, kind of share the same page? Well, I, you know, this week you saw that I think, if I'm not mistaken, Senate did pass a bill this week that will allow VA doctors to make recommendations for cannabis for veterans. And I think that's that, that to me, I want to tell you, is probably one of the biggest breakthroughs in, and I don't know if the cannabis community even understands this, how big a breakthrough this is when it comes to the federal government or an office of the federal government doing what the VA is about to do. If in fact it passes now, I don't know if this passed in Congress yet. Did it no, pass? no, 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 no. So it passed the appropriations through, it still has to go through committee. So we're still a long way. Got it. So, you know, I kind of guess, not guess, but what you're seeing is, is that difference between federal states, right? States rights, you know, you have 39 states or 38 states that have legal. And the District of Columbia, they have some yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 38 states in a territory that have legal cannabis, right? Medical marijuana. Um, Medical and 20, what is it, 26 now have recreational. Recreational, yes. correct, correct, correct. With Ohio, I think, being the just latest. Past one. Yeah, yep. Just corner yep. last night. Yep. So, you know, that's at the state level. But at the federal level, even in the states who are legal, prior to this, you know, and even with the Veteran Protections Act, you had, you had uh, treatment limitations, what I would say where if there's 9 million veterans that are seeking treatment through the VA, uh, you know, including my father's one of them and myself. If and I'm a, yep. If I'm a chronic pain or PTSD or an IBS, this was a subject that we were not even able to talk about. Doctors couldn't provide recommendations or help them uh, do uh, fill out paperwork necessary for them to be able to get medical, medical marijuana. And so this is something that one, we bottom line is that we support in order for veterans to have increased access to it to protect doctors but also veterans to be able to not only discuss it but turn that corner into actual treatment and treatment options and three if i'm a veteran being able to work within the industry um uh it, it does help along that way but now am i not mistaken that there was something passed was it um under the Obama administration that allowed for veterans to still seek care at veteran hospitals if, in fact, they lived in a state that allowed medical cannabis and they were on medical cannabis, the VA would not deny their benefits. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. It's a very... That, yeah, so that, that, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, it is true, um, but it is limited. What it does is is it, it bars... Uh, Congress has barred the VA 
from from penalizing those doctors and veterans that are doing it, not being able to use funds to do it. So it's a limited protection for both doctors and veterans, but it's also a protection that should be available to veterans and doctors anyways in states that are legal. Did, do, what, am I not mistaken, though? They weren't allowing veteran VA doctors to do any recommending. They would allow them to have a conversation, but you could not recommend. Officially, 100%. Right. But, but now if I'm a veteran and I go and I take a blood test and I come up positive, if it's a state that had a medical program, the VA could not deny you your health care, correct? 100 percent. 100 percent. And then when you look at a polling between organizations like AMVETS, in terms of veterans in the VSOs or the veteran service organizations, you're looking at over 80 percent of veterans support and seeking cannabis treatment or or therapeutic alternatives for the issues that they face. And so for the population that served their country in the VSO, it's not that it's going to be ignored and it shouldn't be an issue that is controversial. Well, if you're able to increase the amount of research that is done um, to this and allow access, but have their physicians be able to make recommendations, direct them towards uh, uh, better outcomes to treatments, I think that's something that the majority of Americans would would uh, um, um, support. We know for a fact that I think the most recent poll, it's up to like 93 percent of people across the country polled, no matter where the poll is taken, say that they support a medical cannabis program. Not necessarily if you ask the question, do you support recreational, but they support a medical and the recreational or adult use um, numbers coming in the high 60s, low 70s. So America recognizes that we have been fighting a ridiculously, egregiously um, um, racist law for now close to 100 years. And I'm going to lay it out there on the line because that's yeah. all it really truly is. Right. And we know that there are benefits to cannabis, even if, let's say, you take the THC out of the equation, when you're looking at all the minor cannabinoids, the flavonoids, uh, you know, the terpenes, we know for a fact that there is efficacious usage of this as a product, the same way as it is vitamin C. So it's so ridiculous to me that, you know, there we're holding on to this antiquated, you know, racist mentality. And that's really truly what it's all about because there are so many states out here that have passed cannabis laws, whether they be medical or not, but they are continuing to enslave more and more people of color by arresting them. If you happen to be in that one little municipality next to the one that's illegal, you drive across the street, boom, they arrest you and lock you up under state law. Because why? We've got to feed this commercial industrial prison project that America has been on for the last 40 years. Correct. Correct. And I, you know, the social justice um, aspect of cannabis is part of the reasons why it's hard, right? and becomes, uh, what you say, controversial or, or provocative. You know, as myself being an African-American male and a veteran, it's almost like there's two protected classes, right? So you have a veteran as a protected class, and especially ever since, you know, an all-volunteer force, the propensity to serve comes from a very small segment of the population. Still less than one percent. Yeah, and it's still true for that today. So at the same time, when you... You know, lack of a better word, when you age out, separate or retire, you know what I mean? You are now a member of this protected class, right? And part of that protected class, as it gets older and seeking, you know, a very large treatment, you know, a large segment of, of an issue that's over, uh, overwhelmingly supported. It almost feels like you're getting ignored and not being spoken to at the same time. And so... You know, when it comes to social justice reform, uh, equity and inclusion, that's something that VCP does follow very uh, carefully um, as an organization because we do see it as one. You have classes of folks that, that are, are, are not being addressed in, 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 in policy, but also in terms of, of, of equity. Absolutely. Well, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, we're looking at it right now. And I, from my perspective, I feel like the only reason why, you know, I think, what do we have? Uh, less than 20 states had agreed to same-sex marriage, and we made a national issue out of it. And so now same-sex marriage is, but now you got 38 states 
and the District of Columbia. That's that's more than three quarters of the United States of America that has already passed a law to allow you to use cannabis. And this federal government still sits on the sideline saying the dumbass things like, well, when there's more research done, knowing that they're not allowing the research, but knowing that the research has been done. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I literally yeah. feel like sometimes when I look at a, a news program or something and I see some butthead congressman or senator says, well, as soon as I get more, I feel like reaching in the screen and smacking them upside the head. Last year alone, we were up to over 35,000 peer-reviewed published documents around the world. Some people say that it's even more than that. I haven't found that many more, but every single year for the last five years, over 3,500 peer-reviewed published documents have been put out around the world, ex, you know, extolling the virtues of cannabis one way or the other. There's some of the reports that come back and say there's this problem or that problem, but it doesn't matter. The majority of them have felt the way most science has felt about this since the dawn of man. Right. That cannabis, though it, you can find places to pick at it, no one has ever died from cannabis use. Right. Except for one person that they associate with cannabis use out of California that had really nothing to do with cannabis. It had to do with the moldy cannabis that they were they had consumed and not the cannabis itself. So the truth to the matter is it's probably the safest form of medication that the world has ever known for over 3,000 years. Yeah. You know, it's a, you know, it's like the tale of two cities, right? Federal and state. And at the state level, and the population and the polls are overwhelmingly in the research support, right? And the federal is a little bit slow to act. And, you know, you know, being an African-American or a black male that I see is very, you know, sometimes it's hard to say this states' rights, right? But I, oh, <laughs> but I, I, tell I, you, I was just but listening, I tell, but I was I tell listening you, to Christy. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Correct. But I tell you this. I tell you this, right? Um, the way, you know, local elections are important. Right. And it's important to vote and it's important to reach out to your elected officials. And the way you do that and the reason why you see 24 states and over half the states are have either legalization or medical marijuana is because the populations and the constituents in the, those states have, have said so. And the federal government is, is slow to react to that. But at the same time, also being the federal government has supported, you know, whether it's civil rights quicker than the state's rights, right? And so, you know, there's always a balance and a fine line to it because I've seen our federal government, especially within the DOD, enact policies, whether if it's uh, desegregation, whether if it's uh, uh, um, uh, gays in the military, or, or what have you, enact legislations and policy decades before the general population ever did. And it said, hey, this is what makes a, a, an effective fighting force is the diversity of people, thought, or whatever. And I think even though the federal government is slow on some issues, they're also fast on, on other issues. But I think if people want to get involved, having their legislator at the federal level know your voice and the things that you want to have happen, that this issue is important. The problem is with veterans research in the VA, it becomes clouded with other issues that come up. And so we will make it, we'll, you know, we'll pass a bill. It'll go into committee and then it will be stripped because it becomes too provocative and too controversial. And that's the way that it works. But the consistent presence um, of, the, of, the, of their constituents saying, hey, this is important to us. As a veteran, this is important to me. You have to, do, you have to be able to do that because that's the way democracy works in America. And, you know, but, but I mean, it, it drives me nuts whether, you know, like, again, I think I mentioned something to you before we started. I've been working on a project that's called RTM for years now. Uh, Recon uh, it's called Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories. It is now uh, picked by one of the, the governing bodies for psychological protocols in the world, the, excuse me, the ISTSS, as one of the most efficacious treatment protocols for PTSD there is that exists. This thing has been studied at Walter Reed at King's College, been utilized by the state of New York uh, after 9-11, been utilized by the state of, Mass of uh, New Mexico, been used all over the world and comes up with unbelievable um, uh, numbers. I mean, nine out of every 10 people who go through this protocol, 90% um, walk away remitting 100% of their 
uh, PTSD symptoms in five to 10 hours, no medication. But our government is so hell bent on, you know, some of the antiquated protocols that they put in place, one being uh, prolonged exposure therapy that has never been proven to be greater than 37% efficacious. They will fight till their dying breath to say that that should be the standard of care rather than something that's more proficient, even though they know it's more proficient. It's been, I, I've been, I've been fighting this battle for this for now, you know, really close to 12 years, but honestly, for the last four years, deep in the trenches. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was told uh, years ago, because I work, I've been working on traumatic brain injury for about 12 years also, is that, you know, anything that's transformative in medicine is met with the most vehement and adamant resistance. And when it comes to cannabis, that's one of those things, you know, I mean, we, I think, you know, it's going to be met with the most vehement adamant resistance until some of these school, excuse me, old buttheads die <laughs> off. You know what I mean? Right, 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 right. I agree. I agree. And I think it goes back to that neglected and rare disease, right? What is profitable and what is not. It's one thing to do a study uh, at, the, at the clinical level, but it's another thing to do a comprehensive study. And it's very expensive to be able to right. do and, and, you know, but, but again, see, from my perspective, you know, I'm so sorry to say, but screw the FDA. I mean, you know, these comprehensive studies that they've done on other stuff has proven how they poison people. You know, they can poison people right now with some of the things that have been studied by them for, you know, let's, uh, let's put together a 10 year, $200 million study to see if cannabis really does get people high. Shut up. You know what I mean? I feel like they say, right. shut up. Right, but it's, but it's an opportunity to bridge because the research and the studies are done by small businesses, right? And that is a bridge. That is a bridge to incubate something and to prove something and to, and to make it, to give it that clinical rigor that it deserves. Until well, then, you know, it, 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 I, I would agree with you 100% that it does deserve that clinical rigor. However, you take a look at this plant in particular. You look at some of the other plant-based medications, tamoxifen, some of the other ones that are out there, cancer treating treatment things. You look at those plants, those plants have constituent parts, mm, 30, 40, maybe, 25, 30, maybe. Well, I mean, we've known that, you know, there are probably a hundred plus, we don't, nobody's really laid to figure out. I've heard some Canadian research that says that they know that there's probably over 135 cannabinoids. I've heard that there's well over a hundred terpenes. We know that the flavonoids haven't even been looked at. So when you put all of this together and what Shulam said when his research was that can, cannabis and that plant works an orchestra or a um, uh, an entourage effect. And that entourage effect we're going to find out as we move down the road that THC is not the only thing responsible for what we consider a euphoria. We know that it's going to be a combination of THC, some of the terpenes that we may not have even identified yet, and the flavonoids together that are responsible for maybe the breath of the euphoria. So, and as we look at, you know, I mean, recently, you know, I have products out. I was going to tell you, I was going back to Massachusetts. I literally have project products in Massachusetts dispensaries right now under the uh, Inspired by Montel brand. And I'm about to launch my next CBD brand that, you know, I'm utilizing lots of different minor cannabinoids that people hadn't even thought about. I was talking about this 12 years ago. You know, people didn't even understand what CB, CBC was or even CB, you know, CBDA is. They don't even understand that, you know, there's CBN, CBG, and every one of them has an acid component. So, you know, as we look at cannabinoids, and I think that at the end of the day, we're going to walk away from cannabis the same way as research walked away from aspirin. We know about aspirin. There's probably about 3,000, only 3,000 published peer-reviewed study documents on aspirin worldwide, but we still cannot identify why aspirin works the way it does on individuals because each individual metabolism metabolizes the acid I mean, the aspirin molecule differently, and therefore its effects can be different. That's why some people will bleed to death if they take two. Some people won't, you know, their blood still thickens until they take 10. So the same thing is going to come out when it comes to cannabis, and says maybe we'll just leave it alone and recognize the fact that it works. It does, and, 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 and technology will enable the plant to increase its bioavailability. 
whether if it's delivery methods, you know, whether it's dosage. And that's where it's so important that the research into more progressive therapeutics into designer medicine is so important. Yeah. You know, I, I've, I've done some, some talking to Sanjay Gupta, who, you know, I, I spoke to Sanjay and probably part of the reason why he ever did his very first special on cannabis. And Sanjay and I just spoke after his last one, you know, because one of you know, the products that I'm working on right now um, will be one of two of the only cannabis products that are sold in independent suspense, independent pharmacies in America. I literally signed a deal in Georgia with uh, Botanical Sciences there. And as soon as we get them approved by the state, I'll be one of only their products and our products are the only products that are going to be in independent pharmacies because they have an exclusive two-year deal there. Tilray is one of the other companies that's down in Georgia, but they can't come in for two years. And so, you know, Georgia passed a pretty significant, you know, uh, uh, administrative, you know, rule in their process to allow not only dispensaries, but independent pharmacies to carry cannabis. Right. And um, so I'm looking forward to that because, you know, yeah. from a dosage standpoint and what we're trying to do there and in, in is, I think, pretty progressive nationally. It could be a good model for a lot of the other states. Yeah, I, I think so too. And dosage and, and the way you take it is, is so critically important for it to be effective. Because you'll see, because you'll see folks like I did not have a good experience or, you know, what did, you know, what did you do? What was your experience? And, and, you know, I see it all the time when I'm speaking with veterans and non-veterans and they're talking about their experience when they go into a dispensary and they're talking with the, uh, 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 bud the, the, the bud attendant, you know what I mean? And it's, you know, it's a, it's a lot of hit or miss, but the real true value is that peer to peer interaction where they're talking about what works and what doesn't. But imagine if you take that, you know, you know, with somebody that's suffering from traumatic brain injury or they're seeing counseling for PTSD with that dosage, that regimen, you know, you know, that, uh, you know, that particular product that's going to that's actually going to mix well with their, their, their DNA, their bio makeup. You have a better shot. You have a better chance of hitting that target perfect that improves the level of, of, of treatment um, and it raises I, the standard of treatment for that. I, I hope so. And I think that, again, I, I have, you know, from my perspective, you know, and I'm not knocking clinicians and I'm not knocking clinical research, but I'm going to tell you, it'll be 20 years before you dial that in appropriately. And part 30, of the reason is because 30 we're 30, because yeah, yeah. We, we, we also do know that its efficaciousness is all dependent on the individual. My bio makeup is completely different from yours. What I ate this morning is completely different than what you may have eaten. If I ate something that's got more oil in it this morning, it's going to either speed up or slow down the process of me actually making that cannabinoid more bioavailable. And which one, you know, is the THC going to be more bioavailable if I ate an oily uh, breakfast or is the CBD going to be more bioavailable if I ate an oily breakfast? Is the is it going to be different if I have something that's got higher in humulene or something that's higher in you know uh, one or the other? Uh, uh, yeah, so it, this is going to be it's but, but, zero. You know, yeah, go ahead, sir. I was going to say, but AI, you know, I would love to see if I could hook up with some researchers that are doing some AI right now because I mean I think you could probably speed up that modeling process by letting the computer. Go ahead and put those together and try to figure out why is my absorption rate X and yours Y. We may be able to figure that out and figure out what that median formulation might be that will affect us both similarly. It won't ever be the same, I don't think. Well, we'll, we'll exchange cards, posts, and I, I can help you with that, those groups that are doing that with artificial intelligence. And I think it, I think it's about, you know, grouping those targets, you know, you know, what we talked about is a very finite and we will get there, you know, it'll be like Star Trek, right? We'll have the replicator and it'll do it. But right now, you know, for us, it's about narrowing that target for folks, you know, who've never had a primary care physician, they go to the VA, which it changed and it does has this, it does have a challenge. You know, for example, my father as a Vietnam veteran did not visit the VA until until he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. 
You know, now he's 100% covered, but the VA is the one that found it, not his primary care physician. The VA is giving him recommendation. Now, he just turned 80 years old, and his prognosis is good, but it has spread. So you're looking at a, 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 you know, an opportunity where he is managing his pain, but he will have pain. Do you sure. think my father at 80 years old is going to go into a dispensary and try to get something, you know, that he can one understand and be able to do? But the VA is now his primary, his primary care physician um, right. uh, through consultants. And so for me, it's very personal. Um, and then I know that I'm, I'm behind him as I age in, in symptoms that are maybe mass or that I'm managing uh, through other things, um, that's, that, that will happen. And so um, just to kind of bring it back around, I think it is a good step with the current legislation that they can talk about it. But I think the next step is to be able to research it, um, to be able to talk about it more so we're able to target specific disease states specific conditions and and try to develop those treatments whether if it's you know a little bit of here a little bit of trial and error because the population is is wanting that yeah and and but i I, but also think that we're going to have to hope for and pray for and i think they exist people like yourself and other new era clinicians and investigators who are willing to be open enough to even ask a question 100 percent you know, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, we have some of them who are just so hell bent on stupidity that they won't even answer the question, ask the question. Whereas, you know, uh, it, you know, scientists and especially clinical science is so dependent on trying to find anything but an N of one where, you know, I've been pushing for years that where the research should be is on those N of ones because those N of ones are more than we think they are. You know, when you have a person who has had aggressive prostate cancer and a doctor says he's going to die. And uh, then, you know, they go on a regimen of CBDA with a mixture of a little bit of THC and something. And the next thing you know, the prostate cancer is gone. There's something to that. Let's Correct. not just say, you know, God stepped in. No, something to that. Had they not done that and they died yesterday, you would have said, I told you so. Well, why don't we say I told you so that cannabis actually helped cure them. And the same thing when we look at you know, children who have varied forms of seizure disorders. And we see that, well, maybe with seven out of the 10, cannabis makes a huge difference. Don't now turn around and say, well, it's just kind of lucky they hit that. No, they didn't hit a lucky. The kids actually found something that worked for them. And until we find scientists that are willing to say those kinds of things, I think we're going to be in the same ridiculous boat for a while to come. I mean, tell me a little bit about this veteran cannabis project or program. What is it called? Yeah. So uh, uh, Veterans Cannabis Project was started in 2017 um, from a Navy SEAL. Uh, he was a veteran, uh, obviously. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, his name is Nick Enson. So he started as a way to be able to help increase veterans' access to it. Um, I came along uh, probably about a year ago where I took over uh, as the director. So if you want to go and get more information, you can go to uh, vetcp.org. There you have frequently asked questions. You can sign up, but also we can help direct you to your local elected officials to be able to have your voice be heard. Our primary function is not necessarily at the state's level, but we are a grassroots organization at the federal level. We track legislations, we engage the population, and one, we try to convene the group into a meaningful community. So one, you can have that peer-to-peer interaction, but two, be able to get uh, latest information of what's happening on the Hill, but also to be able to direct those that are one, cannabis friendly to those elected officials and those that are not. Um, You'll see that it ebbs and flows depending upon the party. Some parties are more difficult uh, to get around, but what's happening is the, the popularity and the, the consistent and the persist, persistent voice of the constituents are turning some of those harder parties around. But at the same time, we are going against prior, other priorities and, 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 uh, and it shouldn't be a provocative issue, the healthcare of veterans. And so we're trying to. Yeah, it, it, is, it is kind of crazy to me, especially when we hear all the stories about some of these congressional parties where they're sitting around smoking out in the back of the you know, balcony. Um, yeah. 
you know, and, uh, you know, some of these people should start telling a little bit of truth themselves. You know, I mean, do you, do you put your crystal ball on? Do you think there's going to be any movement at the federal level in the next three, four, five years? Um, I, you know, I think so. I think as state legalization, like we're over half now, um, become, it's going to become a pressure tide. I think it's uh, in terms of uh, descheduling and legalization, complete legalization does help that. Um, and it kind of free things up, but I think that's more than like a year or two years away. So we're kind of just concentrating on small victories. And I think for me personally, this is Steve Jones talking, um, that supporting, uh, additional research on the efficacy of cannabis for veterans on a population is significantly, significant, significantly important, um, uh, for the success to help get those data points that'll help change at the federal level. And I think that's what, I think that's where it happens. I think when you're following the data, you're crunching the data, I think that'll change the minds of those that are a little bit resistant that it will help that, that it can, and it will help. You know, when I, I, I've been, I've been in this space now for over 20 years, long before this was Vogue, you know, I was out, came out about cannabis back in 2001, right. Literally testifying States all over this country you know, trying to allow patients to have safe access to efficacious medication. And, um, you know, in this whole period of time, I, honestly, if you had asked me back in 2001, I would have told you it would have been done by 2012. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Um, in 2012, I would have said it would have been done by 2020. Not. Ask me right now, it ain't getting done before 2025. Yeah, I think, so, I think the last, you know, the last thing I talked about when I did visits on the Hill, 2025, 2026, maybe, but in the springtime, you kind of get that tide or it's like everybody's happy and it goes, but then something else or a priority or the bill or the language gets stripped. Or, and, or, and I'm so sorry to say it this way and please forgive me if it, if it, it bothers you, but I'm going to tell you, there's so many politicians that are so full of shit that they will say one thing when it's time to get reelected and then say another thing after they get reelected. And we just saw that with this administration that's in office right now. Yeah. They talk yeah. smack. We're going to do something in the first hundred days. Bullshit. They didn't do anything. And they still aren't doing anything. And they're trying to make excuses for it now. So, um, you know, and I, I will bet you wait till the middle of next year. I bet you both Trump and Biden come out saying that they're going to make sure they make significant moves in cannabis. Bullshit. When Uday and Kuse get a chance to hold their own dispensary, <laughs> Trump will jump aboard. And then, right, you know, right, uh, right, right, and, right. And, and Biden is going to do so just because Uday and Kuze got a board, you know, yeah. the, the Trump Jr. And, and Eric. Um, no, no, not a politician, not offended, not a politicians. I just live amongst them. Um, yeah, so, so, <laughs> but, I think, but I think, though, one of the things that I, I wanted to make a point about, you know, back 20 years ago, there were so many organizations. I remember bumping into people down at the Capitol, you know, knocking on doors, arguing and knocking on doors and arguing. I was bumping it. I, I, I would go down there for the MPP and the DPA would be there. I would go down there for DPA and the MPP would be there. I would go down there and then normal would be there. There's not that much knocking on doors right now. And I think, you know, I'm so sorry. When the cannabis industry finally recognizes how well the pharmaceutical industry is done by lobbying, putting their efforts together. First off, we don't even have a national cannabis organization. How sick is that? Right. You know, everybody's too busy trying to, to buy their first yacht rather than trying to figure out how the rising tide lifts all boats. You know what I mean? So the second that this industry finally gets off of each other's back and comes together and says, you know what? I'm not going to have a big conference just so I could sell some more of my bullshit to another company. But we come together and say, let's have a national conference so that we can all talk together and figure out what our lobbying efforts for the year will be. That's when this is going to make a difference. I agree. You know, organization is key. I mean, even even for veterans and veterans issues, there's, I think, 55,000 nonprofit organizations that that support veterans specifically. But there's only 11 that are recognized by the Department of Defense that can essentially recognize for veterans. Um, and it's hard and it's very difficult to get to that prize. And I Absolutely. think for the cannabis that recognition and organization is key to any voice being heard. Um, you know, I don't, 
you know, is that is that strategic com, uh, that strategic uh, communication set that's so important for any type of organization set. And I think for the cannabis for the cannabis industry itself. One of the things that talked uh, that I talked about, and when it comes to uh, diversity and, uh, and inclusion, that when you look at uh, African American businesses and venture dollars, you know, less than one percent, um, and they're getting into this industry, um, there's, you know, is there a protected class code for those to be able to be able to get loans to be able to start businesses within Kansas? I think that's critically important. I see it in the veteran population as well. You know, you have service disabled. Uh, small businesses, those are tremendously helpful for them to be able to participate in terms of small business with the Small Business Administration. I think yep. some, I think something similar uh, can happen for those protected classes within cannabis. Um, there's examples of success where that's happening, whether it's with the SBA um, and the VA and getting those protected classes, because at the same time, you have large and small businesses. I'm a full believer in small businesses, but when it comes to speaking at this level, a collective voice is a much more significant. One-off congressional engagements won't get you anywhere because you'll just walk right. out the door. You know what I'm saying? Right. But a collective voice, an organized voice going in, will they will start to pay attention because Congressman, you know, your House representative every two years, Senate every six years, president every four right. years. And they'll listen because now you have, you know, the slits to be able to stand around as long as they do. You know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's well, thank you so much, Captain. Thank you so much for being a part of the show today. And one more time, give out the stats if people wanted to help support VCP. Is that what it's yeah, called? Yeah, yeah. VetCP.org. Uh, come visit. Uh, we're on all the social media. Uh, websites, uh, Twitter and Instagram. You can send us uh, inquiries. You can send us questions. And if you have questions about who to write, who to talk to, please send it our way. And then we'll funnel out to where it needs to go. Absolutely. Well, happy Veterans Day to you, Captain. And, you know, I, it, it, it seems like just lip service, but it's not. Thank you for your service, sir. No, sir. Thank you. Happy Veterans Day to you. And thank you for your service. Absolutely. You'd be well. Reach out to us anytime. I, you know, share that card. We'd love to have it. Um, I, we're done. So, folks, thank you so much for being a part of the Veteran Day. Uh, let's be blunt and make sure you keep tuning in. Let's be blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments. Uh, 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 uh,